And so, my dear friends, in order for a deal, Bring a friend. Out of this world, this house of worship. No vaulted ceilings, no stained glass windows, eye opening, mind boggling. It's easy to get lost in the wonder of all the incredible things we can now do. You could spend hours, even days, walking the aisles, noting ideas, savoring them, jotting them down for future reference, meditating on them. Splitting the atom is a minor part of it. We now stand on the brink of being able to transform ourselves and our environment according to our whim and caprice. We ought to be pleased at what we can now do, and we are, which is why science, for some, can be obsessive, can be seen as a cure-all and as a challenge to faith. A nagging question arises. Which is worse, relying too much on science and technology or dismissing it entirely? Have we lost our sense of the spiritual value of the material world? Our sense of wonder about it all? It's a question with far-reaching consequences. It's one thing to worship material things obsessively as an end in itself and quite another to ignore what is happening all around us. Is formal worship the only spiritual activity open to us? Are there not opportunities here and present, part of our spiritual activities? The Vineyard. We have discovered more about the planet Earth in the last decade or two than in previous history, and this has deeply affected our understanding of creation. Behind the scenes, it is being reformed, reordered by our technological genius. Few indeed have plumbed the meaning of all this as yet. Modern discovery has focused on the pieces, the fragments. Can these pieces, these fragments, be reassembled into a fuller vision of the world?
biological science, for example, has presented us with a whole set of issues which at their deepest level involves an appreciation of what a human being is. Here, inside the nucleus of the cell, is the play of life itself. Long strings of DNA, the cell's memory. We once thought of the DNA as immovable, a fixed component of the cell. We now know that their function depends on their ability to move around. The sequence of pins determines the information the piece of DNA contains. It's the language of DNA, the code. Perhaps a hundred or more pins are needed to make a sentence, to make a gene, enough to code the composition of a protein. It is this protein which determines the color of your hair or your eyes, the shape of your nose. As the cell prepares to divide, the DNA makes a replica of itself and then intertwines, winding themselves into coils of DNA. The coils remain tied together after duplication, then slide from one another to set themselves free. Now there are two cells, each with its own nucleus, identical. Inheritance has been carried on. The basic process of life has been completed. Our knowledge of the DNA has set the stage for a new world of gene-spliced plants, animals and humans. More important than any product or results from recombinant DNA technology, however good and salutary, is the clear understanding of the very basic unity of all living systems at their most fundamental level. This will have a profound effect on our view of the universe, especially the universe of living systems. It dwarfs the results of our previous unitary understanding, even at the speculative level. And this deeply affects doctrine. And yet there is very little serious theological investigation of this new knowledge. We are already across the borders of a terra incognita. Where are the Christian explorers, settlers in this new land? Where are Catholic scientists? Without them, the church will never be at home in this new world opening up before us. In the life sciences, biological industrialization has begun on a significant scale. These sheep, for example, are experimental and they are cloned. The spotted ones have been used as donors and recipients for micro-manipulated embryos. You may wonder whether these techniques could be applied to human embryos. Well, being general techniques, of course, the micromanipulations could be carried out with any mammalian embryo, including a human embryo. But I think it's a question whether the result would be the same. One, there's no guarantee that a human embryo would have the same viability, the same spare capacity for development that a sheep embryo has. And there are a number of other uh, problems, both technical and biological problems. And of course, on top of that, there are, there's a, a very serious problem whether one wants to undertake that sort of thing in humans. But as far as the manipulations are concerned, they could certainly be done. 
In this way, almost without knowing it, we have entered into the era of predictably intervening into human life. I know that you'll find many people who express antagonism to molecular genetics and to what is loosely called now genetic engineering. I'm not one of those people. I believe that without genetic engineering of human beings, the human species will become extinct. This is the first time that any species has had enough knowledge of genetics to be able to control its own destiny. Nobody has ever had that chance before. Sex is fun, but it's not the best way to make good people. One way in which selective breeding might be accomplished is shown here. The idea is a simple one. Mature eggs are removed from the ovary of an individual of selected genotype. This uh, is fertilized with sperm from a similarly selected individual of good genotype. The fertilized egg is then allowed to divide to the 64 cell stage and is then implanted in a receptive uterus where it grows into a fetus and thence into a normal child. Let me show you a film strip from an in vitro fertilization clinic. The basic technique is nearly a common procedure now. To obtain the uh, human egg, uh, this is done by the procedure of laparoscopy. The egg, once obtained, is put in normal saline solution and fertilized with the male sperm. That fertilization occurs and the embryo then develops to a multi-stage, multi-cell stage and is then implanted in a receptive uterus. We uh, might wish to select for particular genes such as those associated with high personal energy, those associated with longevity, and those associated with high intelligence across the board. But I think that uh, once we recognize the moral necessity of limiting ourselves to two children or fewer per couple, it's a short step to a new morality that says, uh, uh, since we can only have two children, uh, let them be free of genetic defects. The next step along this course is a still newer morality that says, uh, since we can only have two children, let them not only be free of genetic defects, but also let them be endowed with the very best genes available. The biological field is fascinating to me because we are acquiring a detailed understanding in a general way of the precise biochemistry of life. A detailed understanding can lead to detailed control. Uh, there's something that looks fairly interesting. Maybe we have an egg here. This understanding of life and the control of life processes, although you may consider somewhat futuristic, 95% I would say of all research biologists would agree. And if we can obtain this in the near future, say three, three, 30 to 50 years, and this will result in what I'm fond of calling the big payout, namely life extension. I think it's safe to say that 95% of all biological researchers would agree that we're going to be able to control life. Whose control of life? Whose vision of the good human? Can we settle for a narrow, grail-like quest for the perfect sperm, the perfect egg? Can we define the human only in terms of DNA? Reproductive technologies make it possible to move from sex without babies to babies without sex. Thus our century's long understanding of this matter has begun to unravel, precisely because of technological advances. It is clear that we cannot contribute to any discussion of this evolving technology until we understand what's going on. Where are the explorers, the settlers, in this new land of gene splitting?
Artificial intelligence, machines that can reason, judge, understand. Can they? Will they? The advent of fifth generation computers raises serious questions. What is a human being? What is human intelligence? What is the difference between a machine-centered society and a human-centered society? In the exploding world of information technology, the medium is silicon, but the message is salvation. The ability of a machine to sort out a world of crushing complexity, to save us from sickness, oppression and danger. There is no end to the disciplines, the possibilities invoked now in the name of artificial intelligence. Inference and reasoning, planning and problem solving, learning, logistics, linguistics, even psychology and philosophy. Computers have changed forever the way the world thinks, acts and plays. In the future, for example, there will be no lower labor costs than the intelligent machine. This single, simple idea, when realized, will have an enormous effect on the distribution of wealth. Now the cost of labor is more and more shifting to those areas where labor costs are low, principally the third world countries. But with new and even more advanced electronic robots, production can and will return to the rich industrial nations. What then? How will these economically depressed countries respond in the face of mounting debt and massive unemployment. We are talking now about large areas of the world's inability to feed itself and promote work for its people in a nuclear age. Society clearly benefits from intelligent machines designed for human services. These range from the frivolous to the fantastic. A robot for geriatric care that listens and never gets tired of hearing your favorite stories. Or one for those who have little or no control over their arms and legs that brings their world a little closer. In time, too, computers no larger than molecules, microscopic computers designed to circulate inside the human body, even within living cells, can be programmed to monitor vital functions. But all this may be a Faustian bargain. Will the computer ultimately homogenize us? Will computers replace teachers? Will education become standardized and therefore sterile? Will the classroom look more like an assembly line than a place of learning? The demands of the new technology are voracious. The human brain itself is said to be in need of improvement. These are all my sculptures. This one is quest for better brain. Present man with a small brain, defenseless. Lizard-like, he is climbing out of the darkness of 20th century towards his best hope, the better brain. This is a hybrid a combination of Albert Einstein and Albert Schweitzer because I think that is what we need. Not only better brain, but also better instincts. For the past 18 years, we were studying conditions to obtain optimal brain development without changing the genes. So it will be not genetics, but euphenics, the improvement of the, uh, of the phenotype. That means it will be the non-genetic bioengineering. Well, will it ever be possible to uh, devise such methods to be used for humans? We don't know. But if it will be possible, it will be very important. Uh, we mustn't forget that all these experiments are just the beginning. After all, this is only 20th century. Are we, as Carl Sagan has suggested, only a collection of water, calcium and organic molecules? Can we accept such a limited notion that all things, all human beings are malleable, manipulable? If the mechanistic view of the human prevails, 
Will artificial intelligence make our choices for us? The smart weapons of the 80s, for all their sophistication, are mere wind-up toys compared to weapon systems possible soon when intelligent information systems are applied to defense problems. An astounding new breed of weaponry will be created and distributed in the 1990s and beyond. Smart robot weapons, drone unmanned aircraft, unmanned submarines and land vehicles that combine artificial intelligence and high-powered computing. All these can be sent off to do jobs that now involve human risk. Machines can be used on battlefields to coordinate complex weapon systems. Will the human race destroy itself? Out of history comes a sobering truth which speaks to the probable risks of such an event. The human enterprise, we have come to learn, for all its brilliance and creativity, is basically blundering. We talk of systems that will protect us and improve our lives and welfare. Smart, dispassionate machines, programmed to exclude error. We design for zero probability of error. But we know that there is no such thing as zero probability of error. Can we forget that an unprecedented series of mechanical failures and human errors took a reactor close to meltdown? If political balances are precarious, how much more precarious are the biological balances? We know now that with our weapon systems, we can blow up the world and do it instantly. But disaster can come as well in measured doses and over time. The possibilities arising from a misuse of genetics, for example, are much more subtle, but just as pernicious. Will we destroy the vigor and beauty of human life because of our meddling in it? Will the tremendous potential for good built into the life sciences be squandered in misuse? of science is proceeding at an astonishing pace, but Catholic thought, built on an antiquated understanding of creation, is in disarray. The call of the bishops in 1977 for Catholic scientists to form communities to pool their experience and wisdom has gone virtually unanswered. Where are our scientists? What are we doing to encourage them to dedicate themselves in a mission to the scientific community? Will science be the one neighborhood in the city of the world in which we have no evangelists? Christians at a distance, never to explore the principal issues of our time with our hands, in our lifetime. Why do we remain so remote? Don't we understand that our world is constantly being reshaped? Have we a right to shape the vessel if we don't work the clay? The options are clear. If we are to remain faithful, there is no choice. There is only decision. <laughs> 